welcome to Cloud Realities, an original podcast from Capgemini. This week, a conversation show exploring the state of the art of drones, how that fits in with things like intelligent industry, data platforms, and we might finally get to the bottom of when we're going to get flying cars. I'm Dave Chapman. I'm Esme van Agiesen. And I'm Rob Kearney. And I am delighted to say that joining us for the chat today is Dario Valenza. He's the founder of Carbonics and speaking to us direct from Australia. Uh, Dario, just want to say a quick hello and introduce yourself. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm Dario. I'm the founder of Carbonics. Very good. And you are joining us from where in Australia? Uh, Sydney. Sydney, beautiful. Beautiful. And thanks so much for spending Friday evening with us. So I think it's, has it gone dark yet where you are? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 8 p.m. It's only um, the beginning of spring, so it still gets dark relatively early. Oh, that's the bit about you're coming into your summer and we're declining into the winter. Oh, curse the Southern Hemisphere and all its good weather. And joining us from the other side of the world is our intrepid producer, Marcel. How are you doing there, Marcel? You all right? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Still on holiday. Late holiday this time. Yeah. Literally hear the waves in the background. Uh, Ez, how are you doing today? You all right? Yes, I'm I'm doing really good because, you know, every minute I'm getting closer to drinks with a, a fun group of people. So, yeah, couldn't get any better. Fabulous. I'll have fun. Now, Robert, what's confusing Hello. you this week? What's confusing me this week, David? Well, there is a war, I think, on principles starting around the way people are integrating AI into their ecosystem. Mm. And this is best borne out by the Google versus the Apple debate, which is if you're a Googler, yeah. your AI is integrated into the Google ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But if you're on Apple, what they've decided to do is take all your context and use ChatGPT as the engine. So essentially, they've, they've federated with ChatGPT. And now if you do an AI type thing on your uh, Apple device, it's going to go all the way over to ChatGPT and process there and come back. So you could argue that ChatGPT is actually the best or the gold standard in AI engines at the moment and the one that came to the fore and created the generative AI revolution. However, your data and Google and Apple have a lot of data about you, let's be clear, and we trust them to a degree with that because you run your life off the back of these platforms. How do you feel about all that data now potentially being accessible by ChatGPT. And it's starting a raging debate about data privacy, and there's lots of concerns about it. And again, regulators are starting to get interested. And I'm a bit confused about, is this just this going to be the natural federation? We've talked about You know, the phone experience changing from it's just an API into everything, and there's one app and you talk to assistant, and this is just the next evolution of that. Or is it actually, there will be a debate about, you need to keep your data inside the closed ecosystem, and actually the AI engine from within is the right... Uh, the right strategy. I'm confused about how people are going to react to this and data flowing around. We've discussed in the past about terms and conditions. We like threads and they own everything associated with anything that goes into the platform. So is it just the next set of mass proliferation of your data going elsewhere? And I am confused about where it's going to go with the couple debate. A couple of thoughts on it. First of all, the Apple decision, you know, you know, kind of thought, is that similar to when they used to integrate Google Maps? E.g., they just hadn't got their map technology yet there, and a, they wanted that on the phone. And what, what, what a bit. Well, the big argument there was Google wouldn't give the location data back to Apple, and that's why they fell out. So it was actually an argument over data that meant that the, the Apple Maps, which has had an interesting history, um, some would say it isn't quite where it should be. Uh, that's why that whole project got started because of a data argument where Google wouldn't release the data outside of the ecosystem. Now, on the data, and your question there. I think what's going on in my head is I'm not sure at this point whether it matters as long as the data exchanges are, are you know are, are legal safe you know kind of controlled versus you know spitting random data into into different sections of the internet without really thinking about it but, you know like why is it why is it better or worse that my data is, you know, kind of going to be resident in open on, on OpenAI's servers 
an Apple servers versus, say, a Google servers. So I think the point is, you, you hit the nail on the head. If you trust the organisations, then okay, fair enough. However, can I point out to several long stories in the press about how tech companies may not have acted in the best interest of the end user and may have sometimes, just occasionally, put profits ahead of data privacy. And this is the rise of the, the legislation that we see and why certain services now don't get launched in, say, the EU because they have much stricter regulation about protecting the individual. And so I don't, you know, trust is a, is a key part. And I'm not sure the tech industry has demonstrated that we should give it the trust that they think they should have and what the consumer actually believes to be true. Well, there we go. So I think it's regulation. It's a regulation question to me, not an architecture question, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's the point that you can't rely on the tech companies to to protect the consumer so much. It's going to be the regulator that has to mandate it. I think actually there'll be a huge debate about the two ecosystems being connected, especially in the EU, who have started to, who have started to become very tough on this sort of stuff and in the right way and for good reason. Maybe to jump in, I think with... AI, there's a difference of kind as well. If you look at Apple and Google storing your data, when it's just literally, it might be an email, it's your information, it sits on a server, it's segregated, it's tagged, and you know they may or may not use it in a different way, but it's knowable and controllable. Uh, I think with AI, there's a certain permeability that comes with the way the models learn and improve where the data could leak and nobody would know, or it could go and influence Great something point. else. So I think it's a, it's a slightly, it, it's analogous, but there's an additional element. Yeah, it's actually more risk that then something that you've done trains the model and off it goes and bang and there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think or it comes up in somebody else's answer because it was part of how the model learned about that specific area. So it could be your competitor, it could be. I think, Dario, though, though we've, we've come back to Rob's question, I, I think what we have to recognize here is that this was just a thinly veiled attempt from Rob to try and promote Android over iPhone again, wasn't it, Rob? <laughs> yeah. I, I've had this conversation, Dave, and, and one day you'll see the light. And on that note, on that note, on that note <laughs> let's start with Carbonics themselves. So why don't you just give us a sense, Dario, of what is it that Carbonics do? So Carbonics is about aerial data capture at scale, meaning we take a payload that has a, a capacity for a high resolution uh, imagery or scan uh, or live video. We carry it over assets over large distances for a long time. Uh, so it's really about, obviously, the, the vehicle that does that is a drone. Mm. Uh, the drone is the tool, the output is the data, uh, and our specialty is putting the package together of the, the aircraft, the systems, uh, the processes, the regulatory approvals, to be able to do large-scale aerial data capture. Right, right. And so give us an example of the sort of scenario you might do that in. Yeah, so our principal customers are utilities. So power lines, uh, we do a little bit of work for open-cut mines. Uh, anywhere where you have um, spread out assets that require regular high-resolution uh, scans to generate digital twins effectively. Something like a power line would be a good example where it's a, it's a linear asset, it's spread out over uh, large distances over the countryside. Um, you know, doing it with a satellite wouldn't give you the resolution you need. Doing it with a crewed aircraft, which is sort of the, the, the old way of doing it, is expensive and potentially dangerous. And there are limitations around the conditions in which you can fly, how low and slow you can go. And so a drone really slots in to be able to give you that, that high resolution over long distances and large areas. And are these drones autonomous? So you set them off and they go do the scan and then they come back and the data capture occurs. How, how is it actually working? Is there a human in the loop? What's the setup? Is it like a, a load of them go out or is it one? What, what's the kind of approach you would take to sort of deploying it in the field and sort of getting all the data back and collecting it? Uh, yeah, so it's a pre-programmed mission. Uh, so generally with, um, you know, where the asset is, you know, the terrain um, and usually it's a repeat mission. Uh, so you upload to the aircraft the, the path that it's in, intended to follow, um, yeah. and it will then go and execute the mission. It'll take off. They, they have vertical takeoff and landing, so you don't need an airfield or a prepared area. Um, you'll go up above any local obstacles, transition into horizontal flight, and then start your scan. Uh, in the case of a power line, it'll be usually two passes sort of there and back um, over the asset. In the case of a mine, it, it'll be a, a grid scan, and the aircraft will just fly a grid pattern. 
Mm. Uh, for a survey, the information will be stored on board and retrieved on landing. Uh, if it's um, what we call an ISR mission, so surveillance mission, uh, where there's a live feed, then it'll just be transmitting a video back to the operator. Uh, and the operator can actually manipulate the camera independently of the aircraft. Uh, so it varies from mission to mission. And there must be a safety feature here, the ability to hunt for like a human in distress or find, you know, something that's gone missing, et cetera. Is that a, a scenario you get involved in as well? So you're being able to, to programmatically hunt a particular area for something? Uh, we can do that as well. So again, with, with a scan, it's sort of pre-programmed and you just fly the planned mission uh, with something like a, a surveillance mission. And again, with, you know, security, military, you will have uh, image recognition on the camera. You'll have the ability to pan zoom until the ca- camera independently of the aircraft and then tell the aircraft to follow a target or loiter over a given area. And so that really depends on the mission. And, and we are fairly agnostic to the payload and those specifics. And we partner with our payload suppliers. So, for example, the gimbal camera that we use uh, will have those features built in and will integrate it into the aircraft. And the aircraft basically provides a platform for that payload to stay airborne long enough, reliably enough in weather um, to, to be able to execute that mission. Cool. Pretty cool. I like the the shots of the footage when, you know, there's like a, a massive field with like loads of drones on and they all take off at the, at the same time to do one of those drone shows. That's the sort of thing you've got going on in my head, Dario. <laughs> that, that's swarming. Uh, I mean, I know you're talking about light shows and... Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, in some applications where you want to cover an area, you can use a fleet of drones. Uh, so, for example, one application uh, is uh, bushfire or wildfire prevention uh, monitoring. So the prevention is uh, basically what we, there are two, two flavors. Uh, one is fuel load monitoring, which is basically just a scan that will give you actual data about how much flammable material uh, is in a given area. Uh, the other flavor is what we call storm chasing, which is looking for smoldering tree trunks after a lightning storm. Uh, so we're partnering with the, partnering with the Australian National University who's doing some work on that. And they're looking at this sort of large area coverage and that will involve eventually a fleet of drones rather than just ones and twos. But again, we, when you think drones, you know, there are multi-rotors, there are sort of little um, you know, DJI quadcopters that you can buy down at the shops and go and fly. We're a slightly different looking uh, aircraft with Think oh, yeah. of a glider, effectively. So, six meter wingspan, fixed wing aircraft oh. uh, that can carry five kilos, like in Interstellar. Have you seen the beginning of the movie Interstellar, <laughs> yes. where there's like, where the, the drones have gone rogue and it's just like flying around and they like chase it in their car and have to bring it down. That kind uh, of thing. Yeah, and they almost drive over a cliff. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's sort of yeah, that, that's not dissimilar. So, in terms of the the wingspan and the shape. The only difference with ours is it has vertical takeoff and landing. So it has a, a set of four sort of horizontal rotors uh, that lift it off the ground so it doesn't need a runway. You know what this sounds like a precursor to to me? Flying cars, Robert. <laughs> oh, not this again. Dave. Now, we, we've, we've attempted to crack the whole flying car thing on the show a couple of times before. And I think we actually have a legitimate expert in this field. I would say, Dave, that you've become obsessed by the concept of flying cars and have been perennially disappointed by what's been presented. It is the, it is the disappointment that I'm obsessed with, Robert. Well, we, were, it, we were promised flying cars what, What's happened is you've ago. watched the film Fifth Element where a yellow taxi cab from New York style flies around and you think that's how the world should be. So, Dario, we were at the um, World Telecoms Conference in uh, February this year in Barcelona and there was a great deal of hoo-ha about a flying taxi that they had at this conference. And it, people were talking about it. There was a bit of a buzz on the floor. So a couple of days into the, sh- into the show, we had a bit of time off. We walked, you know, kind of 3,000 miles across this conference center to go and see this uh, flying taxi. It wasn't a flying taxi, Dario. Uh, it, it was a shittily designed helicopter. Yeah, it was a, it, 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 the way you described it was quite properly. You just went, that's a helicopter with more rotors. Yeah. But what I loved was I was looking at your face when I revealed it and went, look, it's a flying taxi. And you just went, what is that? It's like if you took the idea of a helicopter and you sort of made a retrograde version, like a worse version of a helicopter, you'd be <laughs> something like what this flying car looked like. It was incredibly poor. But like from your view, though, you're putting, you know, big 
uh, you know, sub- quite substantial aircraft up that have got vertical takeoff and things like that. So w- what's your bet on, you know, when Uber, for example, are actually going to have some form of recognizably car-like machine that you can get in, like a Blade Runner spinner? So I think when, when you look at the fifth element, Blade Runner, th- those kinds of cars that hover, Hmm. Um, there's a leap that needs to happen in terms of how they hold themselves aloft. So there's some new kind of anti-gravity propulsion or some power source that we don't yet have that would allow that to happen. Hmm. Unfortunately, we are still constrained by the physics of internal combustion engines, batteries, and we need to either beat the air into submission with a rotor uh, or have enough airspeed to fly on a wing. So the reason our drones look how they look is that they combine the two. So they, they beat the air into submission with a rotor hmm. for the shortest possible time just to get off the ground and get above any trees or obstacles around the launch area. Then as soon as possible, they transition into forward flight and then they're on the wing. Uh, and that is a much more efficient way to fly. That means that you're basically only needing to provide enough thrust to overcome the drag uh, and you're getting all your lift through the wings. Rob's been working on a on an anti gravity propulsion system, haven't you, Rob? <laughs> yeah, I think you watch too much sci fi, Dave. You need to take a break. Watch the documentary channel instead and get some re- realism back in your life. I think you've been you, you can get you confused. Man. It's just you like del- documentaries twenty years ahead. Dario, do you do you need to ask permission every time you do something? Like because if it's quite you know up in the air, do you have to like warn the entire ecosystem and get permission before a drone can set off? Uh. No, not exactly, but th- there is a process that you have to go through. Um, so that regulatory framework has been evolving. And again, we're now, you know, Carbonics is 12 years old. Um, we've been working on this for a long time. We've seen that regulatory framework evolve as you know, the standards are set and the regulators get their head around it. Mm. Uh, especially at the moment, if the operator has what they call a remote operator certificate, um, so the, the sanctioned to fly drones commercially, they can fly anywhere, anytime within certain conditions. And that's generally keeping the drone within your line of sight uh, in uh, certain kinds of airspace and not over populous areas. Hmm. So it sounds quite restricted, but for a lot of the missions that we do, that's fine. Yeah, there's a bit of a synergy, isn't there, between the sort of things that literally you would need it for and, and the fact that, you know, it's unpopulated so you can send them out there. Well, that, that's, again, part of the, the reason we focus on the areas that we focus. Mm. So utilities, um, spread out assets, uh, large companies with big needs, so few customers with a lot of area to cover, uh, happen to be in the middle of nowhere. So as, as a starting point, that is easier. And then as you develop, I guess, the trust with the regulator in terms of putting hours on the system, um, getting all the engineering in place to demonstrate that everything's built to a, a high enough standard that you mm. can be very confident about the mean time between failures, et cetera. Right. Uh, then you sort of start to expand into more populous areas and eventually uh, will be fully integrated into sort of legacy airspace. Gotcha, right. So what's the time frame on that, do you think? And, and from, so from a standards developmental perspective, how challenging is it? Uh, so it, it has been, I guess, on one level, frustrating because it's just the speed that they move at. Right. Uh, but on the other, quite productive because we have a good relationship with the regulator and being uh, an OEM at the forefront of, of this kind of uh, operation, uh, we were able to, to have those conversations to inform them where it was very open, where they're like, okay, this is a new thing. We don't know how to regulate it. Um, tell us what you're doing. Let's look at the risks. Let's look at how you're mitigating them. And the, the, the regulations kind of evolved around the specifics of the technology hmm. um, because again it's, it's, it's a brand new field and obviously there's a there's an existing body of regulation for crude aviation legacy aviation uh, different kinds of airspace different kinds of certification processes for different aircraft and we have to fit into that so we, we take some of it in terms of the engineering and the reliability of the system the way we train our pilots the way we set out our operations and do all the checks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but obviously there are some bits that are not applicable because A, we're not carrying a human and B, the pilot is not co-located with the aircraft. So mm. there's some sort of proxy to account for that. So as a customer, how do I consume the service? So presumably it's some form of drone as a service 
type situation where me as a customer, I've presumably got some form of data platform or tooling that I need the data input into. So I, it is the way that it works is I come, I come to Carbonics and you effectively provide the infrastructure to get that information back to me. Is that broadly how it works? And what kind of business cases have you seen? Like how creative are they? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the customer will, will have an existing, either their own ecosystem or they'll use a, a supplier to do that. Uh, they will ingest the data and generate the insights that they need. Uh, our job is to capture the data and that, that's the input for the customer. Uh, and, and that means getting the accuracy and the precision required, the geotagging, the format of the data, how they want it, uh, and the frequency, getting it when they need it. Um, so basically they look at, look at us as the source of the data and, and you know, frankly, they couldn't care less whether we use a, a drone or a hot air balloon or whatever else. Right. But it's, it's really about getting that data in a timely fashion uh, and that on our side means we, we need to not be too restricted in terms of weather, in terms of um, you know, reasons why we can't fly on a given day. Uh, so that uptime is really critical. Um, now, having said that, the, the business model has evolved because sort of naively at the beginning, we're like, well, we're an OEM, we build aircraft and we sell them. Mm. Uh, and there are still certain types of customers that want to own the asset. And in that case, we'll right. sell them an aircraft. Um, and then we'll either provide pilots or we'll partner them with an operator. Mm. Um, it's still fairly varied because it's a new ecosystem and different people want to do it different ways. Um, for some businesses, for example, the CapEx is uh, less important, so they're happy to buy the asset. For others, they want it to be an OPEX. Uh, and then for uh, you know, the military and security, they want to own it because they want to operate it themselves. Uh, so we're fairly flexible. But the, the main core of the business and the business model that we have is to offer the data as a service. Uh, and we build our own tool to go and capture that data. Can you pilot the drones remotely? So you you, you can you don't have to go on site or do, you, or do the pilots have to be on site? Uh, so the ultimate aim is what we call remote one-to-many. So you have a, a remote operating center. Um, imagine fancy screens with um, dots on them and each one is a drone. I think, I'm and thinking you're missing a trick if it doesn't look like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, my friend. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> It's sitting right the there. It's theory. sitting right there. I think, Dave, we need to have a chat. It, it's except that they're not cathode ray tube screens. They're actual, you know, modern. Yeah, yeah, like modern, like a modern, like an next generation <laughs> version. Yes. Yeah. So, so that again, that's a journey. So, at, at the moment, we we actually are certified to do remote operations, and we have a remote operating operating center. But most of the time, we do send a pilot out with the aircraft to watch it take off and start on its mission. Um, and then over time, that'll transition more and more into effectively the drone living in a box out in the field and being deployed remotely. Very cool. Very I, cool. I used to, I still work with a chap who for a while was over in Perth and worked in the mining industry and the trains have a long way to go, Australia being very large. And they do that. They have a control center set up where there's a train driver and they're driving multiple trains and they'll occasionally send a helicopter out to check on it. But this idea of there's such a vast area to cover, I can be remote and control it. And we've seen that with the military application and drones as well, where basically the pilot's in a porter cabin and the drone is far, far away. So yeah, it's, it's, mm. it's, it's starting to get like that on many applications, isn't it? It's just making sure that you've got the correct communication network in place to make sure Look, it's reliable. And, you know, as, as, as glamorous as, all, as it all sounds, it's down to unit economics. Mm. Um, so the fewer people are involved in the operation, the cheaper it is. Yeah. Uh, the more area you can cover in a given flight, the cheaper it is. Uh, so they're really the drivers. They're being able to have one person control multiple drones and have them fly long missions. That's really where the economics start to make sense. Because if you look at um, the early days of, of drone adoption, where multi-rotors have sort of become commoditized and you could go out and buy one, and uh, most people are comfortable flying one because they're quite intuitive and they're fairly um, easy to deploy and control, the fact that you can only do 20 minutes of flight at a time means that logistically you have to take off, do your whatever area the multi rotor will cover, land, change the batteries, relocate, launch again. You end up with all this massive disparate set of data mm. that you have to stitch together. And there's so much time spent between the deployments uh, and you have a team of two people on the ground and a vehicle and you can't get to certain areas. By the time you add all those costs up, you're better off just hiring a helicopter. And so to really to be competitive in that in that space, uh, you need to get those unit economics down. 
I think the big thing for me is when I look at this sort of stuff is battery technology has not progressed a lot in the last 20 years. The lithium ion came along and there's talk of solid state and lots of companies come to market to say, oh, this battery's amazing. It charges fast and it you know, holds much more capacity. Does it feel like you're waiting for that evolution of you know how I can store energy? And then that changes that economic model an awful lot. So rather than 20 minutes flight, you get 60 minutes flight or 120 minutes flight. And then suddenly that whole um, logistics system will shift. And do you have a view on that and where you think that's going to go? Because lots of people talk very positively about battery technology. We actually look at the reality on the ground is it's not going anywhere fast. It's all tiny little incremental improvements slowly, isn't it? I think I've already said this is why we don't have flying cars because batteries don't have enough energy. Um, I, I, I uh, thought we were, I thought Rob was repeating what we'd already covered earlier too, Daria. But uh, <laughs> anyway, let's let's. Uh... Oh, okay, all right. I had a slightly different point about the logistics of it. Now that can all change the economic model. But fair enough. Just rain on my parade. Uh, absolutely. So we we have two models of our aircraft. There's an all electric one and there's a petrol hybrid one. Uh, and to give you an idea that the sort of order of magnitude, the all electric one. Uh, we can eke out three hours out of it, which is yeah. really good because our airframe is really light and efficient and three hours is a lot for an electric drone. Um, the petrol one can fly 10 hours. Um, and the petrol one is a, is a hybrid, so it also charges the, the, the house batteries, the avionics batteries as it goes. Um, now, our constraint is that the VTOL has a very high instantaneous power draw. And so the batteries have to be sized for that in, in terms of C rating and the ability to sustain that initial big burst to get it off the ground. And after that, uh, consumption goes way down and it just sort of trickles uh, the, the pusher propeller. Um, and the, that sort of drives the size of the battery. But in a drone, it's even more important than, say, in a car, where mass is so critical. Um, and so the energy density is a constraint. You're absolutely right. And hence, using a petrol hybrid to, to really get that range. Although, as you say, petrol hybrid drone, I have this steampunk vision of what it looks like with lots of tubes sticking out the top and it's flying around. Like, yeah, but I suppose that's just me, I guess. Uh, we've not tried the steam powered one. Maybe we should look into it. <laughs> yeah. An external Go combustion really old engine. school, really back to the days of when it started. Yeah. Moving on, though, to something extremely exciting in your world, the America's Cup. And, Ez, do you know how big the race? Courses for the America's Cup. God, no, I have no idea. Robert, do you know? I'll go for 7,000 miles in length or something like that. Brilliant. Is, is it miles out? Is so it miles out? out? Yeah, excellent. yeah. That was an excellent guess. It is. <laughs> it's, a, it's, uh -oh. it's three kilometers long. What? And somewhere between 0.9 of a kilometer and one and a half kilometers wide. No, no, they go for long times, David, so they're just going in circles. The, teams, that the, team, the team turns over which side they enter from as the boat coming in from the right-hand side as the advantage with the right-hand right way. The race course is about 1.7 nautical miles long and between 0 0.5 nautical miles and 0 0.8 nautical miles with boundaries on all sides that the boat must stay in. So I'm getting that from americascup.com. No, <laughs> no I, I'm confused now because I thought the America's Cup sail... 7,000 miles. Way. Yeah, so, yeah like 7,000 like, miles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to justify my <laughs> stupid guess, aren't I? I was like, try, trying to recover. I've clearly not covered myself in glory throughout this podcast. Uh, so that's been two. Uh, so I'm just waiting for the third it, cock up it, it and then we'll be done. It was a terrific guess, Rob. Uh, I'm glad you came in this one. <laughs> I, sorry. I'm, okay, fair enough. I'll just stop now. I guess you go, go big. When the couple's in San Francisco, it was in catamarans and that's when hydrofoiling really started to become competitive. Because, I mean, hydrofoils have been around since, since the 1960s. Um, but in the context of the sailing boat, the net gain of having hydrofoils was not evidently there because uh, the foils were too thick and too draggy and the, the physics hadn't been resolved and the structures couldn't handle it. Um, and so being able to have the carbon fiber materials and the computational fluid dynamics and the, the data available to really optimize hydrofoils meant that from about that time, they, they became competitive. Uh, and so I was involved in that. And it was actually the early days of carbonics at that point. Uh, I was consulting for one of the teams um, in developing these hydrofoils. So Robert, I understand that our sponsor, Cap Gemini, is also doing pretty exciting things with the America's Cup this year and are a big sponsor of the America's Cup. Yeah, yeah, we are. It's, uh, it's, it's quite cool, actually. It's called Windsight IQ. Mm. And it's this technology that basically allows you to visualize the wind 
live on the screen. Huh. So like fans and commentators... Like, like wind tunnel style. Well, almost. no, you get like this coloration going over the top to show you which direction the wind's going in, where it is, how it's moving around. Because obviously in this type of sailing little wind currents all over the place can mean the difference between winning the race and and not. So you get this view of what's going on. So you can understand like optimum routes and what team tactics are actually going to play out like. And it makes the coverage for the the people watching the sport far more interesting because you can sort of see where they're going and what what they're about to do and how that is impacting the race. And it's it's really cool. If you check it out on like YouTube, Winsight IQ, you can see... um, an example of it and how it plays over the top of the coverage. And I mean, if you think about it and there's all that other stuff going on with technology where they can put the flag over the bow and they draw the lines on and everything else. So it's again, that sort of technology making sport more interesting uh, to watch. You can use it to review what you did, see what was actually going on. And stuff. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, I mean, it's going to amass a huge amount of data and then what we use with that, that data for moving forward can be, you know, we can really think about the sort of the algorithm helping out future uh, future performance and such. Like. But of course, there is the just the broader entertainment value, which is you can see so much more information about what's actually going on in such a complicated sport. Hmm. So Dario, so much technical advance in both what you were saying there, some of the recent case study that Rob's talking about. Have any of these things made their way back into the world of drones that you're focusing on right now? Absolutely. And to, to put into context the 7,000 mile thing, um, think of America. All right, don't cup. bring it up again. God, opening, no, close, oh, that I heard that's like, isn't it? It's like 305 <laughs> times bigger than the America's Cup. 309, race actually. 309. Yeah. <laughs> Just to correct. You can, you can think of the America's Cup as Formula One as opposed to, um, you know, round the world racing, ocean racing, which is like rally. So, Around the world racing, you're you're against the elements. People, you're you're having 24 hour cycles of people sleeping and, and sailing the boats, and it's basically man against the weather and so on. Um, America's Cup is very much it's a controlled environment. It's a flat course. It's about getting around an artificial course as quickly as possible, and it's day sailing with rescue boats present. So that environment means you're chasing single digit percentages of performance. Mm. And there's a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of very motivated people uh, doing that. And so coming out of that environment, you get tools that are able to um, generate very accurate models that can predict performance. You generate manufacturing techniques that can optimize materials. Uh, Again, carbon fiber, titanium, the, the stuff that you need to really get that high performance. And so that translates exactly onto drones because we are looking for the lightest, most efficient, lowest drag platform uh, to carry our payloads. So if we can make our airframe, you know, one gram lighter, that's an extra gram of fuel that we can carry and we can go that much further. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that throughout the whole thing uh, means that that really gives us the edge, um, the ability to have that efficient aircraft. And there's also a cultural element that comes into it as well. That, that sort of experience of being in a competitive environment is very analogous to a startup. You have limited time, limited budget, it's competitive, you've got to get it done by race day. Um, You have to come up with creative ways to to have the fastest boat you can on the day. So that actually translates to the cost as well. Ez, what have you been looking at this week? Yeah, so we've been talking about a lot of innovation ideas uh, throughout the shows and especially also this week I've been tackling with failures and types of failures to actually get those innovative ideas and work done and looking into Amy Edmondson's work which we've discussed previously before as well and talking about psychological safety Mm -hmm. she's actually talking about different types of failure that can actually help you know to to unravel it and understand how and why things go wrong Uh, so you have these preventable failures and I think we all know those right the human errors there's plenty of them in my career if I'm brutally honest you just need my career to examine this human error well this podcast is is a great example of my ability to provide human error into the system what's your biggest human error error Rob oh failure we haven't got long we haven't got long (laughs) there's a there's a a long list uh that is that is quite an interesting one um meeting Dave Chapman 
<laughs> Can we go with that one? <laughs> Some okay, would frame okay. it like that. <laughs> yeah. So you have preventable ones. You could have prevented that, maybe. Um, it could also be a complex failure. Because, you know, it's Dave, so, it, you know. <laughs> he has many levels, actually, as you unpack it. So initially you think, oh, this is quite a good thing that's just happened to me. And then the layer, and then the next layer. And it's a bit like a Christmas tree. It goes down, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. Someone said it keeps on trunk. giving, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so a complex failure in that sense is like maybe a software failure, huh? That results in different interactions, multiple modules that you couldn't see up front as a, as a designer or as a developer. So that's more complex. But we're really looking forward to intelligent failures. Mm. And I've done quite some presentations on Agile and I heard quite some leaders say to me, oh, please leave out the failures because that's negative. Mm. And it's actually not because, you know, if you feel really good, then you can actually learn from it. So I'm just very curious, Dario, do you have like an example? In like, I think one of the easiest one, or at least for my, in, in my mind is like, did you ever lost a drone? Like that it went off and you've never found it again? Or, or you know, what types of failures have you come across? Uh, fortunately, we've never lost one in a way that we haven't found it. But certainly during testing and development, we've crashed a lot of them. And you do that in a controlled environment, in a, in a, in a clear field with a good plan around what, what, what you're going to do if X and Y happens. But definitely there's an element of trial and error. And when you're dealing with a complex system, uh, you can simulate so much, you can sort of do as much as you can in preparation. But the reality is that until you put the thing in the real world, in its environment, uh, you don't meet those corner cases that, that really show you how things can go wrong. Uh, so when you think of a drone, it's, it's, a, it's a packaging exercise of making a whole bunch of stuff talk to each other that doesn't really want to talk to each other. Uh, so you've got your avionics that are giving the inputs on how to control the thing and where it's going to go. They're getting inputs from things like airspeed sensors, altimeters, uh, GPS parks, uh, I news and getting all that stuff to, to, to speak the same language. And, and you've got everything from, you know, how the length of the wires affects the uh, signal integrity, electromagnetic interference from the electric mm -hmm. motors, um, getting all those bits to talk to each other in a way that's reliable, consistent, and where if you do get a gap or an error, you don't have a catastrophic failure mm -hmm. is a massive engineering task. And it's, it's taken us years to get that right. And that's now our sort of IP and competitive moat and trade secrets. Um, but being able to do that requires trial and error. And every time you crash, there's, there's a, obviously it doesn't feel good, but you go and you analyze it. And, and also very important to make sure that you're recording everything. So all the various telemetry channels, you've got cameras on the drone, you can see what happened. Uh, as long as you learn from it, that informs you. And we always say internally, we'd, we'd rather crash it in testing than crash it with a customer. And so far, that's what we've done. Yeah, and that's the key, isn't it? The, you, you said at the beginning, as long as you learn from it, you know, it's it's useful. There was a great phrase I once heard very on in my career, which was "Let every mistake you make be a new one," which was kind of that <laughs> yes. recognition to say <laughs> you're going to make mistakes, but as long as they're novel and you don't repeat Just them, don't make the same. Everything's good. I don't know if you guys we mentioned movies before. The I think it's the right stuff. Whether they're going through the the testing of the rockets, and there's the guy in the lab coat in the lab coat that presses the button, and every time the rocket blows up, and by the end of it, he's got this. Um, dread of pressing the button because the, the rock is going to explode and eventually it works. Mm. And we've kind of gone through that phase and gone through all the failures to get to a point where we properly understand the system. We know the failure modes. We've got the fail safes in place and the thing works. It reminds me of uh, Musk's response. You know, when he was testing the vertical landing boosters and there was loads of failure videos and everyone was being snarky about it. And, and he came back with a comment along those lines, didn't he? Like, well, we, we're not going to get to this. If we don't lose a few on the way, it's like it's part and parcel of the journey. So very physical manifestation of learning loops. Hardware is hard, right? It's, it's you, you need to physically build the thing and physically test it and physically see how it behaves to learn because it's just as much as we are smart and we can model and predict and think about things, how things are going to happen, there are just so many variables um, that when you combine them all, things come out in ways that probably couldn't have been predicted. Mm. I did a two-day workshop once at the beginning of a, a cloud transformation program that was running. And one of the things that we wanted to try and communicate as, as part of that journey, it was, it was in very early days of things like agile working and, and adaptable thinking and, and things like that. And we did a, a, a session called, you know, fuck-ups. And 
everybody had to sort of present to the room something in their kind of career that had, you know, kind of not gone well. But then also then communicate, of course, their leadership reaction to it, how they dealt with it, you know, kind of how they then incorporated that going forward. And of course, it's those it's those moments where all of the big learnings happen. And building that into your culture, I think because you, you become a much stronger organization for being explicit about those things. We actually did that at a bank that we you could actually win a, like a Michelin star restaurant uh, uh, dinner with your team if you had the biggest mistake of that 12 weeks. Uh, just to highlight that you are allowed to make mistakes and make the the best one, but obviously without, you know, causing... <laughs> Rob, that means you could have had four Michelin dinners I a year. I would be yeah. the size of a house <laughs> if that was a policy where I work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, and I've, if you look into the preventable ones, it's the human error, right? And if you then dive into the agile values, I think there's there's friction there. And there's, you're absolutely on a point around, I always, uh, we've spoken about this before, but the airline industry has an open concept of when mistakes are made, they're analysed, and that has dramatically improved safety. Healthcare has a closed system when it comes to mistakes. And there's a whole, there's a, there's a whole book written on open and closed systems. And mm about the if the medical profession had been an open conversation when mistakes were made, the amount of preventable deaths would be dramatically less these days, but they've never had that culture. But the aviation industry has always had an open, let's investigate our mistakes and learn from them. And pilots are asked to declare them and they're protected when they declare these faults. And that that is two industries with dramatically different cultures, but they have the open system has saved mm many, many lives, whereas the closed one is under heavy scrutiny saying, actually, how does healthcare become more open in its analysis of mistakes? Yeah. Interesting with, with the, the way we look at, you know, failures in testing to really understand the root cause. Um, there's, there's quite a technique and a skill there because it's relatively easy to find the proximate cause, like, you know, connector came loose or something broke. And then why did that happen? Was it a quality assurance issue? Was it a selection of the components issue? And it comes down to the design process. It's like how how did the design process allow this component to go um, to become the one that was specified? Mm-hmm. And so you, you you go layers deep. And as you say, it's not a you, you keep it blame free if possible. It's, it's really an exercise in learning, mm-hmm. um, and you have to have that trust there that that you you can look at those things and and improve rather than sort of blame someone for it. Well, I was, I was actually going to go back as a final note as to your link to psychological safety here and mm. maybe just build on uh, on Dario's point. You know, why is it so critical at this point? Well, I think it's crucial. If you have, if you have the psychological safety, then you, all ideas, crazy ideas, every idea can, can you know, can cross the table. And I think th- those are crucial when it comes to speed, innovative uh, solutions, uh, staying ahead of competitors. Uh, but if, and psychological safety is like the essence of, of creating that room for all voices to be heard. Um, so, so then again, it, it all builds back to the work of, uh, of Amy Edmondson. So it's, um, it's fascinating how all these things are interconnected, but somehow it all comes down to the human aspect of it. I think it might, might be, an element of, by definition, you don't know the outcome because if it's not been done before, it's novel. So there's a chance it won't work. And you have to go in with your eyes open that what I'm doing might not work, but I'm going to try it anyway. And then if it doesn't work, I'm going to try something else or I analyze why or I'll improve it. And so you can't have that safety that uh, someone else has done it or just do it the same way and it's going to be safe. Um, you have to take that risk. And so the, the, the business and the team and the philosophy has to support that. Very good. Excellent discussion today. Dario, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening in your time. Oh, my pleasure. Now, we end every episode of this show by asking our guests what they're excited about doing next. And that could be watching the America, America's Cup with Robert. In a two or, hours, apparently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Hour hour 7,000 miles in two hours, isn't it? It is absolutely outstanding. I'm very impressed. Those things go fast. Or it could be something in your professional life. So, Dario, what are you excited about doing next? Uh, I think professionally, my focus is still on um, the growth of Carbonics. So it's that that journey from where we are now, uh, flying missions for customers, uh, to expanding that market and, and improving the technology to get to that remote one-to-many operations. And so that's that's a journey that we're on, and we're already a long way down that journey, but there's still a long way to go. 
A huge thanks to Dario this week. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks also to our sound engineers and wizards, Ben and Louis. Our producer, Marcel, of course, all the way straight from the Caribbean. Respect to that. And also for the beautiful backgrounds of the sun going up. Oh, we're all into the mood of drinks, or at least I am. Uh, thanks, of course, also to all our listeners. Great that you're part of it. And obviously, we are looking forward to all your texts and messages. We're all on LinkedIn and on X, of course. So uh, text us there or message us there. Or you use the old-fashioned way, cloudrealities at capgemini.com. See you in another reality next week week.